viviamo, viviamo negli eti carici che la bellezza i viola. Hello and welcome to the fifth installment of Lunch with Painted Sky Opera. I'm Rob Glaubitz, Artistic Director of Painted Sky Opera, and we've got a great show for you today as we focus on something a little different. Our past installments have featured professional singers who are in the prime of their careers and who have been performing regionally for years. Today, however, we are focusing on two singers who are just making the transition from university study into a professional career soprano Solve Nesseth and baritone Jordan Andrews. Both Solve and Jordan earned their master's degree in opera performance just this past spring from Oklahoma City University and both performed professionally for the first time as an opera singer in one of Painted Sky Opera's productions. Jordan has been featured in several of our productions including our 2019-2020 season as Fiorello in Il Barbieri di Siviglia and as King Melchior in A Mall on the Night Visitors. Solve debuted in our chorus for Tosca and was due to appear as Charlene in Service Provider with us before the production was delayed by COVID-19 until spring 2021. We'll begin today with a selection from an opera that was supposed to have been part of our 2020-2021 season, Don Giovanni. Due to COVID-19, we've delayed it until fall 2021. Solve will sing one of the best known arias from this masterpiece by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart today. Batti, batti, o bel mazzetto. In act one of Don Giovanni, Serlina and Mazzetto are about to be married. Don Giovanni meets Serlina and immediately becomes enamored with her. He tries to seduce her and nearly succeeds. So in Batti Batti, a contrite Serlina teases and kisses her fiance Mazzetto until he forgives her. Oh, 
really enjoy singing Bhati Bhati because it's so different from a lot of the other repertoire I sing. It sits a little lower and it's slightly more lyrical uh, and it is very characteristically Mozart. I really enjoy um, the sections of it, how sectional the second half is in comparison to the first half, and how it really portrays two moods that um, you can see the victory that she has after the beginning half where she's trying to plead with him for forgiveness. You can see that she sees in her fiance that she has been victorious at the Pace Pace section, which I think is beautifully musically illustrative. Our next selection comes from an opera that is near and dear to my own heart, George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. Based on a book by DuBose Hayward, this tale of an unlikely romance between the street beggar Porgy and the beautiful but troubled Bess premiered in 1935 with baritone Todd Duncan playing the role of Porgy. Besides being one of the leading black singers of the 20th century, Todd Duncan was also my godfather. So I'm so pleased that Jordan is singing something from Porgy and Bess today. Sport and life song that he sings to Bess towards the end of the opera, there's a boat that's leaving soon for New York. This aria takes place close to the end of act three, uh, detectives enter to question a few people of Catfish Row about the recent murders of Robbins and Crown. They all deny knowing about Crown's murder, even though they're very aware it was Porgy who was the one that killed him. Uh, the detectives later question Porgy who enters, and he is asked to identify the body of the dead Crown. After refusing, he's taken to Catfish Row into custody, and Bess is left alone with Clara's baby. And Clara was tragically killed during a hurricane while trying to save her husband, Jake, who was also killed during the storm. Sport and Life, uh, the character who sings this aria, uh, uses this moment to offer happy dust to Bess, who was recently recovering from drug use, and convince her that Porgy is bound to be hung and she should come live out her life with him in New York. This is Sport and Life's aria, There's a Boat That's Leaving Soon for New York. So I decided to juxtapose the two arias that I'm singing for you today with something old and something new. So There's a Boat is one of the most recent arias that I've learned. Now this aria in most cases is performed by a tenor, which I am definitely not one. <laughs> so why I'm singing this aria that's typically meant for a tenor is kind of an interesting story. Uh, I was 
doing my comprehensive exams to graduate with my second master's degree. And uh, one of the sources that I was using to answer these questions was Richard Boldry's Guide to Operatic Roles and Arias. Uh, it lists several different roles and it columnizes each of them into which Fox should perform that role. So I looked at the roles for Porgy and Bess uh, during some downtime, particularly at the roles of Jake and Crown, to see if uh, lyric baritones uh, could sing the roles. In this book, it says uh, Sport and Life could be sung by either a comedic tenor or a lyric baritone, which was confusing at, at first because I had only heard tenors sing the role. But then I later thought that it, uh, the book says, is given similar treatment to uh, some German operettas, uh, particularly Eisenstein, which is also sung mostly by baritones, but is also written for a comedic tenor originally. So uh, after some chats with my coach and my teacher about whether or not I should look into the role, I decided to just sing the aria for fun uh, to see if it fit. And we all think it fits pretty well. So uh, we're just keeping it in my book and we're just uh, looking into sport and life uh, during the summer. There are some challenges though, writing that line between opera and musical theater style, jazz language is pretty tough. I don't want to fully give in to like the music theater language because it is an opera, uh, but I also don't want to sing it in complete classical language because of the jazz influence and the musical theater undertones. So I'm still trying to find that right, fine place to uh, sing this. Uh, another challenge is really just being a baritone singing an aria that's typically sung by a tenor. A lot of the traditional things that you hear in recordings are a little bit higher risk for uh, a baritone and also just the number of recordings that baritones have that you can model from is just incredibly low. Uh, but it allows for me to explore and make brand new decisions and hopefully allow for other baritones to do the same. I was also given the chance to perform uh, in Porgy and Bess with Cincinnati Opera as a chorus member and a dancer. It was such an amazing opportunity to perform with those singers, uh, some of who would reprise the roles at the Met, including the sport in life, uh, Frederick Ballantyne. The work is truly a masterpiece, and I'm so glad to have been given the opportunity to work on it. Jules Massenet sometimes gets a bit overshadowed by his French compatriots Charles Gounod and Georges Bizet. However, he is certainly one of the most prolific opera composers and among the most performed today, with his operas Werther, Thais, and Manon frequently performed at companies around the world. Manon, in particular, cemented Massenet's popularity in his native country of France. Here is Solvay with an aria sung by the title role of Manon, the Gavotte. At the end of Act Two of Manon, the lead character is convinced to leave her love in order to live a better life of luxury with another man. At the beginning of Act Three, she sings the gavotte to the crowd at the promenade, reminding everyone to sing, laugh, and love because youth is fleeting. <laughs> Je marche sur tout 
It is one of my favorite arias to sing, and often it is my starter. Um, one of the reasons I love it is just I love the opera in general. The character is so beautifully portrayed by Massenet, and I uh, really love the gavotte because it's her party aria. It's charming, it's playful, and it doesn't just show one thing. It's got flash, but it's about more than just the flash. It's got a lot of lyrical substance as well and I think it's it's a beautiful aria that uh, shows the capabilities of the voice and also gives opportunities for performance and for acting and uh, making lots of fun choices so it's definitely my favorite aria that I have and I love performing it and I perform it every opportunity I get. In fall 2019 Oklahoma City University produced Donizetti's Lucia di Lamamore which featured both of today's singers in starring roles and was conducted by Painted Sky Opera's music director, Jan McDaniel. Solve played the lead role of Lucia while Jordan played her brother, Enrico. So, as a result of that production, we get to share with you today their rendition of the Lucia-Enrico duet from Act Two of Donizetti's Lucia di Lamamore. As a side note, Central Oklahoma has some excellent university opera programs. Go check them out if you haven't already. Several have even won national awards with Oklahoma City University placing first several years in the National Opera Association National Opera Production Competition and University of Central Oklahoma placing second last year. Opera is alive and well in Oklahoma. So in act one of Lucia, you see that she is in love with Edgardo. Um, who is an enemy of her family and whom her brother hates. And this duet occurs at the beginning of Act Two. Uh, in this por portion, Enrico, her brother, has taken a letter, written a letter posing as Edgardo that was a love letter to another woman to trick Lucia into thinking that Edgardo has been unfaithful to her. So at this portion of the duet, she is lamenting her lost love 
and speaking about how much she has suffered and loving him from afar and how he has clearly not done the same because he's betrayed her. expect not to be able to sing this role or perform this role professionally until I'm you know for another 20 years or so doing the show like you kind of understand where he's coming from like hey my sister is seeing this man that I don't like and if this happens then my entire place that I'm running can just like run to the ground and trying to figure out justifications for that and just like figure out how this character functions but I feel like it's a little bit harder when you're younger. I also don't anticipate singing this role again for several years uh, but because it's quite heavier. I, I do enjoy it though it's very dramatic um, because of the subject matter and the way that it's written and a lot of the stuff that I sing right now is very sprightly and cheerful and it was a it was a great challenge to be able to emote in a different way and I really enjoyed it and that's one of the things I really enjoy about this duet in particular I think you know it sits a little lower than the rest of the role so it's kind of a break and it's also so so tremendously sad and emotional that it's a calm moment in an otherwise sometimes really chaotic story that that has a lot of madness and angst and manipulations uh, this act in particular is actually my favorite act because I do love this scene, the scene with her and her brother, where you see the manipulation, you see the relationship, you see um, some different colors and the music, and it's very 
um, poignant to the story. It's kind of the turning point. It's the point where Enrico, you know, really manipulates her into into the events that happen in Act Three that cause the tragedy at the end of the show. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done. My favorite roles, and it's one of my favorite operas. One of my favorite Donizetti operas for sure. Well, it's been particularly difficult, I think, to not catastrophize. I mean, it, it, it feels, when you finish your degree, it feels like I should be doing something. I should be, you know, I have all the, I had all this momentum and now I'm just sitting here and waiting. Um, and you have to kind of remember that everybody is, you know, not even just the people in the industry, but everybody is kind of, we're all twiddling our thumbs, kind of biding our time. It's, it's particularly difficult to feel motivated to practice and stuff like that. So you just gotta be really diligent about um, reminding yourself of your goals and your own clarity of what you want your life to be and, and the vision that you've had in your whole education. Uh, so it, it's, it's challenging, um, but I think it's a little bit too early to be panicking. So you just, we're just all in this together and that in and of itself is sort of, is sort of calming, yeah. you know? I was, uh, yesterday I met up with, with Chase, you know, social distance, you know, I had a mask on and everything. Sure, sure. Uh, and so, uh, we were talking with, I was talking with him and he, uh, he was like, oh, I love relaxing. Like the first month of relaxing was wonderful, but then like it kept going and it's just like i i really just so desperately want to do something like yeah. it was around it was around this time that i was supposed to be uh heading to michigan for for bayview and that's a little tough i'm very i'm very much an optimist so i know that this covid-19 while it does change a lot of things uh will reach a sense of normalcy in a little bit so it's just staying optimistic uh, understanding that this is only a a setback. It is a major one, but yeah. uh, everything is temporary. Yeah, everything is temporary. It's not going to, or at least I hope so, <laughs> that it's not going to completely trash our trajectory. Thanks for joining us for today's Lunch with Painted Sky Opera. Today's installment of Lunch with Painted Sky Opera will be the last one for a while. We have appreciated your support in this brave new world of online opera and our Opera in Place initiative. We'll be focusing our energies in the coming weeks to other operatic themed online content. So please like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram to see our past production photos, singer spotlights, educational videos, and other video highlights. Also, you can always check out our website at www.paintedskyopera.org for a complete list of the online operatic resources from our Opera in Place initiative. We'll close today with one of the most recognizable arias of all time, Largo al Factotum from Il Barbiere di Siviglia. We produced this opera in fall 2019 with Jordan playing the role of Fiorello as well as covering the role of Figaro. And we're delighted to bring you his performance today of this iconic aria. As always, thanks for supporting Opera in OKC and Painted Sky Opera. This aria takes place very close to the start of the opera. Just before, Canto Maviva, disguised as Lindoro and a small accompanying ensemble, has just performed under Rosina's balcony and hopes to woo her. With no response as of yet, he pays and dismisses the troop, albeit with a huge ruckus. Soon after, he hears a confident handyman coming who might be able to help him. So this was the first aria I was ever assigned, and needless to say, uh, it was very scary at first, especially at 20 years old, when some of the high notes and the patter don't really seem possible or consistent. Uh, also, my knowledge of opera at the time was close to non-existent, so there were a lot of challenges I had ahead of me in learning this aria, but I thought it was very possible, and I was up for the challenge, and my voice teacher and I just kept at it. Uh, so, and despite these challenges, uh, it's still very close to me, uh, this aria, and uh, I like to keep going back to it. 
because of the challenge that it presents, how it's comfortable to sing after the dust is brushed off, and the fact that it's fun to perform, especially in context of the opera. There are some other things in this uh, aria that are challenging, but are still fun nonetheless. Uh, one thing is that no one who sings this aria sings it the same way twice. Uh, there's always something a little bit different, which uh, keeps it fresh and allows for the singer to make their own choices. Although, also, it's uh, another thing is even though it's commonly done in recital settings, I much prefer performing this uh, on stage with other chorus members uh, in the recital setting, and in this case, a virtual setting. It's a little bit tougher for me personally, uh, lack of space, and sometimes the invisible other that you see is uh, make it a little bit harder for me to sing this aria in particular. Uh, but it's still fun. I still love it, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. <laughs> Oh, 
COVID, I was preparing to make my professional debut with Painted Sky in the contemporary production of Service Provider, um, which has been postponed. So I look forward to being able to do that hopefully within the next year. I, about right now, I would be, I was supposed to be in the Czech Republic doing a program in Prague, doing a festival that I was hoping to uh, turn into more professional opportunities in, over in Europe. Uh, but that also got canceled. I'm waiting, I'm practicing, I'm keeping in shape, and I'm making recordings to be ready for pre-screens and audition season in the fall. At this time was when I would be going to Bayview. A couple of my friends uh, back in Missouri were planning on doing a show, which also eventually got canceled. People who were at Kismet who were also planning on doing a show, uh, which also, that got canceled. In the meantime, uh, I don't have any performances coming up, so I do plan on uh, working for the school as a pianist uh, one more time, just to save up money for the next big move, uh, wherever that may be, not sure yet. Just trying to keep my optimism up and take the chances where they come. And then the other thing that I am kind of selfish of is because I got a sword. Yes, it was so I fun. Mean, it was... Can you do uh, opera? I want a sword! Were, yeah, we were constantly told to not be playing with our swords, but you know, <laughs> with the sword, it's so hard! It's so hard.